Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is the next edition of the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Cast. As here on the Hockey Cast, I'm joined by a very special guest from Hockey Buzz Cast and the great Locked On Flyers podcast, Russ Cohen. Russ, how are you doing this fine day? Good. How are you? Good. It's always good. Uh, the, the storm kind of came in, but I got in my walk and I got to take my dog out for the walk. So all right. the rain's now. I could, yeah, I could highly care less, to be honest. Once all those things get done for me, I got to do DoorDash and make over 100 bucks today. So I'm a happy person. I, if, the rain ha- if the rain comes, the rain can pour down. So. Right. That's a good day for you, Joe. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good, successful day. Usually it's not that successful during the early week. Um, but um, let's just jump right into it. I would say the first thing I want to talk about is something that became more pertinent in this series than it did the rest of the postseason. But then we have to obviously talk about how good Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl are. But when it comes to Edmonton, a big bugaboo for them was the fact that their starting goaltender was 40-year-old Mike Smith. Now, he tried his darnest, obviously. Mm-hmm. He didn't suck. But, like, obviously he wasn't the answer, and everybody kind of knew that going in. Like, if you had to rank the goalies in these series, I would think he would have been fourth. Mm-hmm. And then even maybe in some people's list, even if you included Francois with how he played other than game one he got thrown into you might still have put him forth because of how he played after that so like that's kind of what my take was on him but like i've always liked him in his career he's kind of like that craig anderson style high compete level but never the sexiest production goalie but like he always competed highly it's just he wasn't the answer that's kind of what i took from that yeah he's a little bit past it there's no question he um you know his lateral movement the way he sort of like was jumping at pucks to try and cover him because he just knew that he couldn't get to him at times. Uh, all of that was apparent. You know, his team's offense is so good that they almost overcame that, but they couldn't. You know, next year, uh, they probably have to beg someone like Mark andre Fleury to take a one-year deal, uh, something like that, and you hope that he could, you know, give you something. It'll be better than what they've had. Uh, but again, it's an older goalie. I don't know if they're going to be able to get anything much better on the open market that's the that's the real issue because then you're really getting into the one B territories and there's not that many one A's out there and the Leafs need a goalie and there's some other teams that need goalies too so I you know it's not a robust market for for Edmonton. Yeah, the one thing I personally, which I think is the wrong move if they do it, but could easily see the Oilers doing and just kind of doing the stereotypical how people say the Oilers are going to do what the Oilers do sometimes to make mm-hmm. fun of them. Paying Jack Campbell a crap ton of money. <laughs> well, Campbell's <laughs> going to get good money somewhere. He's going to get over five million. Yeah. Probably is going to get three to four years. Uh, whether it's the Leafs if they, you know, go over their budget and have to do something else or somebody else, he is going to get it. So they'll definitely call him. And but again, I think because there's such a in a cap spot too that you know they may have to come short of what is what he's looking for, which is what happened with Markstrom. Yeah. That's why I wonder if um, when Kaka line and re-signed, because didn't Corpy only sign for like one point something for next year that I wonder if that was 100% for him to be the backup or more let's explore the trade market since he has such a cheap contract as he's bound to be. No, I think it's should be the backup because I think there's hope <laughs> okay. that they could become a playoff team and, you know, Merzlikens can't play. Nobody's playing more than – you know, 58 games these days. So, no, I think they did it to keep them. Okay. No, I was just curious because once yeah. I saw it was that cheap, it seemed like it was a contract that then was easy to trade. I mean, it is, but then they have to go looking for a goalie again too, and I don't think they are going to do that. I could be wrong, but... That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. But I would say when it comes to Edmonton, I think Flurry would be the most ideal. It's just... I don't know if I see that happen. I, I I still just think if I had to have a place to place Jack Campbell, I think it would be Edmonton because they would just find a way to do it and probably mm-hmm. make other decisions that kind of fall into the Duncan Keith category to do it, where it's like, well, let's just get this veteran that's still great in the locker room. Well, trying to figure out a very nice way to say this is I like Duncan Keith a lot. Not very yeah. good on the ice. No. <laughs> so, like, no, he's seen better days. I mean, he you know, the problem is, if you could limit his games, you know, put him on like load management, you might be able to get a little more out of him. 
Yeah, like if he was a third line defenseman, I don't think he would be exposed like he was right. this year. But the fact that I'm playing twenty something minutes a night, you can't yeah, have Duncan Keith that's doing tough. that at this tenure of his uh, career. But now moving on from the Oilers to a team that I think has been not just in this postseason, but in this season, one of the most interesting teams in hockey, and that's the New York Rangers that did lose last game, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that they gave Tampa too many power plays where otherwise Tampa wasn't able to beat Igor. So, uh, one, what was kind of your take on that third game that Tampa was able to come back and do you think that's going to spell Tampa actually being able to come back or the Rangers still kind of have their footing more in this series? Yeah, I think the Rangers still have the footing. Um, it took Tampa to, you know, 41 seconds to go. Yes, they did come back from a two goal deficit. I think the Rangers will, will learn from that, that maybe they didn't play it exactly right. And Tampa did play it exactly right. Then the power plays are a factor. The fact that Tampa was running over Shesterkin as a, Seemed like a strategy is going to change whether Gallant sends Truba after some of their guys or Reeves is going to do that. Somebody's going to do that. So they sort of can limit that because without that, you know, Tampa hasn't still looked like the team of last year. They're still good and they're still opportunistic, but they're not as fast as the Rangers. Uh, they, you know, they're not even getting better goaltending. I mean, just durkin has been playing better than Vasilevsky. That's just a fact. So, uh, you know, in the end, I think this will be another close game, like a 4-3 game. I think the Rangers could take it. That still doesn't mean it won't be a seven-game series, but I do think having home ice, uh, they still are in control of the series. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I did a short, like, one of those one-minute, 50-second short clip videos on that earlier yeah. where I predicted the Rangers and said I would bet on the ring. Well, I did bet on the ring. I <laughs> said to people that I would bet on the ring. Uh, but the, I think, um, they are team because Kako's also one of those guys, he only has five points, but when I've watched, like I've watched every one of their games or every other team, I haven't watched every one of their games, but their games I paid attention to closely just because they're a fun team to watch. Yeah. Uh, Kako's even been very noticeable in the ice. His point share hasn't been there yet, but like this, the puck battles he's able to win for Heidel and Laffey has been noticeable from his age 19 and 20 season to now his age 21 season. Like that growth of being able to kind of handle getting banged a little bit and keep the puck on his blade has definitely been shown a little bit in the postseason when that's more obviously noticeable that you're getting bashed around more and they allow more where that hasn't even affected him or that young line at all that they've smartly kept together for the most part. Andrew Kopp became a brilliant pickup for them. So, uh, I think their team kind of just perfectly blends, but Toronto is probably one of the more underrated, not utility guys, Swiss Army knife guys in the game that you can kind of just put wherever the heck you want, basically. If he needs to be on the first line, you can put him on the first line for 10 games. If you want him on the third line, you can put him. So, like, I feel like they have a couple guys like that. And then Mott's fantastic defensively on the fourth line. So is Pedro. So I think their team, that's why. I said this about the Mets, and this is going to make you happy, Russell, in another podcast. If I had to pick the World <laughs> Series winner right now, it would be your Mets. Um, but if I'm I had not to going pick... there yet, I'm not going there yet. <laughs> I need the pitching to settle out. They're doing great without their top two, but I need to see more. No, yeah, I'm still there, and then I need to see more, Boo. But with even the Yankees, I still need to see more with their health going forward because I know yeah. it always in. Game 82 is, oh, my God, what happened to everybody? Right. So that, that's, the, that's the other uh, side of the equation there. But, but, but anyway, back to hockey, just kind of like the Mets, I feel like right now the team I'm leaning for kind of having that magic sauce like uh, you see the Giants have when they beat the Patriots. You saw the Eagles have when they had no business winning that Super Bowl in 17. Like there's teams that have that. Even when the Flyers got to the Cup, they had zero business getting there with the goaltending carriers on the head. Right. So some teams just have that magical touch. The Rangers feel like they had that all season where also the difference from a lot of those other teams is the Rangers have so much potentially elite young talent that's just not elite yet, like that whole kid line that is now starting to really show up and show out with the Panarins, with the Sabanajads, with the Criders, the Vetranos as veterans. Obviously, um, you have the heart and soul of the team in Chris Kreider, that is a guy that's continued to have his bat out of hell season as 10 goals in the postseason. So I think he's led the team the entire season as the pure leader and everyone's followed him and they've just been great. So 
they would that's kind of why they would be my team to pick because their defense Schneider stepped up in the postseason enough like he hasn't been fantastic but he hasn't also done mm-hmm. bad so he's just doing what he needs to do uh so I think everything's just falling into place for that team that the only way I ever see them losing is if you start in this bad though because yeah. I think everything kind of fits for them though yeah, I think a lot of things do. Getting Goudreau back was a big deal uh, to face Tampa. That was, you know, massive. So that's really helped. Uh, you know, now they're without Strom, so Rooney's going to come in. But Rooney's a good penalty killer, so the penalty kill will get better for this game, which wasn't great. Last game was like, eh. So that will help them. Uh, the kid line's been terrific. Like you said, Kako's actually been really good at puck possession and and just um, – and now because with Hedl and Lafreniere, they're able to get him the puck near the net – that's where he's going to score from. Like if he doesn't score from around there, he's not going to score as much. So those things have been going good. Justin Braun's done a really good job too. Uh, he's been the one who's helped Schneider along. And the fact that he's playing the left side, which I knew he could do uh, all those things have been going good. Uh, you know, Tampa is tough, but I, I think the Rangers are okay, but really the, the avalanche I think are the team to beat right now. Yeah, they are rolling. My, my, my big thing with the avalanche is, They've been playing at such a octane pace. The Rangers kind of know how to play both ways, or the Rangers going to be able to figure out a way to slow down the Avalanche, and then they're going to go, okay, now what the hell do we do? <laughs> Just well, because, I think not because they will, can't figure it out, but more, I think Shostakovich will have to be the one to ultimately slow them down, and then I think um, they'll get physical, even though Colorado can get physical. But I, I think those are the two ways. Yeah, it's a good point where where I think the Rangers probably do have the guys like you have the Ryan Reeves of the world. I wouldn't say Colorado is anybody that directly compares to him. And so, Truba. like, you do have guys like that. And true, but yeah, he's one of the best open ice check, not probably one, but the best open ice checker in the game right now. So, um, yeah, you have to fear Trubo on the ice all the time. You do. Uh, so, I think the that, that I, I feel the Rangers I just picked because I always have that Mixed with the new school liking for hockey, like I update with the times, but still have some old school thoughts, which yeah. is I like when teams are very good both ends. Where I love the Avalanche, but I wonder if they're going to be able to keep that same. And I know they can play in all different styles, but they haven't had to recently because of the teams they've been playing. So against mm-hmm. New York, are they going to be able to then adjust back to playing more tempered pace and then pushing it when? they need to or are they still going to be trying to push it at full throttle and then screw themselves over because New York is one of the best teams at taking advantages and getting steals in neutral zone and taking advantage of the other team's mistake. So like that will be the worry I would have with the Avalanche if they can kind of slow themselves down a bit because they haven't had to do that against their other opponents yet. Sure, that's fair. But other than that I have no concerns for them. So yeah, I think that would be a heck of a cup and I would hope that that becomes the mm-hmm. cup because I think that's still too Assuming Darcy kept herself, even though Francois on a big goaltender, but Darcy yeah, Francis is Francis has done okay, and Kemper, I guess, was the backup last night. So, yeah, um, I think they they give Francis game one because he got him there, and then I think after that it would be up to you know they may switch back to Kemper unless it's Francis's lights out, then they keep going with him. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, he is a good. His only concern last year was he just was unhealthy. Where he yeah, he was unhealthy. First. Was unhealthy and then got rewarded this year. He's by like a system a guy. He's okay. He's not second. super fantastic, but he can get the job done. Yeah, he's literally a backup. Like he's not a one B. I would say he's no. pretty much you know, just straight up backup, but a but a very good one that's able to really get the job done as a backup. Yes. That can play like twenty games, fifteen to twenty. He's not going to get to that thirty to thirty five. You'd say he's in a one B, uh, but no, I, yeah, I'm confident in both of those teams. I think that would be the biggest. Uh, thing for them going forward but now as we move on from the playoff teams and round out the podcast we have to talk about uh the team here in the city of brotherly love the philadelphia flyers a little bit uh the most painful team to talk about out of all the teams we talked about in this podcast Uh, but when it comes to the pick if you were the gm especially now knowing Mirachenko's healthy too, which throws a completely different fork in the wrench of kind of what happens in the top five. I would say, what would be your pick if you were Chuck Fletcher? I don't think Mirachenko will be in the conversation, to be honest, because um, I still think there's a couple things. I mean, now I think 
you know, he'll get picked either late first or, or, or somewhere in the second, which is good news for him. Uh, I still think it's if you checks there, they're going to lean towards him. If Savoy's there, they're going to seriously consider him. Maybe they'll talk about Gauthier for a few minutes. Me, I would, I, I would take Savoy, but I think if me, if Yurichek is there, I think that's who they're going to go with. Okay, yeah, I actually, yeah, I was the, I was more in the. I feel like they're going to pick Yurichek if he's there, just because he has more of the skill. Like Nemec is great, but doesn't have the like from people I messaged about him the fantastic skating of Yurichek and. Is that going to translate better? Yeah, so I mean, Nemec is, is smooth. He's a good skater. He could do all those things, power play. But there are some shifts where Eurocheck can kind of be like a destroyer out there um, just with his physical presence, but also uh, him bringing the puck up the ice. He's hard to handle at times because he's got long reach. So, um, yeah, I do like Eurocheck more. Yeah, yeah, I feel like Eurocheck might have the chance. So but other teams, other teams okay. like Nemec more, so that's, you know. That's why he okay. probably goes beforehand. Yeah, he could even quite possibly go to Seattle since they really need a defense. Yes. Then, uh, we would, it would be back-to-back Dima and uh, Nevik and Eurocheck at that point. But uh, for me, if we picked a forward, though, um, Savoy, if he's still there, I definitely would have interest in just because of getting to watch some of his games, um, having one of those jailbroken things that, give you every channel in the history of the planet earth that has the juniors on uh, and all that other stuff. Uh, but I feel like he does have, like I've seen comparables where at first, that's kind of why I started watching him a lot. Cause when people were like, Oh, he's comparable to Brady Boy. I'm like, like that's kind of when you first look at it and go, okay, that's uh, I'm yeah, I bristle at that. Like I'm not a guy that gives comps, um, but I will say a good friend of mine, Shane Malloy gave uh, Mike Comrie as a comp. And I think that's, that's really good. I think, um, that one's pretty close because Comrie as a smaller center, and I do think Savoy can play center. It's easy to say, well, he'll play the wing and he'll be good at it. That's true, but I do think he could still possibly play center. Uh, Comrie was really good for the Oilers, so um, I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. I think um, Savoy, because he's so smart and with the speed and the shot, could even be better than someone like Comrie. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do too. I also think um, another guy I would potentially think about there just because he might have one of the better shots in the draft that the Flyers do just want a pure scorer. He's probably more seventh or eighth pick, but you could pick Kemmel with the fifth. You could. Um, I, I like Lekaramaki better, actually. Uh, I think he adds more things offensively than Kemmel, but I do think Kemmel's got this like long torso where I feel like that's an advantage for him. Uh, he's got long arms, and I think also he's got um, a good frame to put some muscle on. So Kemmel would be a hell of a guy. He has got a terrific shot. He does play uh, chippy two way, but like Haramaki, I think is a higher octane offensive guy. Uh, he may not have the wrist shot that Kemmel does, but I think he's got the one timer that Kemmel doesn't. So I think it's you know, I like like Haramaki better. Yeah, I mean, okay, that makes sense. A guy that I feel like has fallen down that I've always liked in the draft that now in most matches in the teams is Deke. I've watched a lot of him too and always thought Deke uses now. He does he have to improve the skating more? Yeah, but most guys that are six four, two or five coming into the draft, the knock on them is improve their it is is improve your skating over time. Where if you use your body as well as he does, I'm not gonna get overly concerned by the knock being the kid has to improve his skating because he's probably gonna be solid as a third or fourth line level immediately if you were one of them to be because he's so good at just boxing guys out, where that's something that most guys don't usually figure out until they're like 22 or 23. Like Morgan Frost, or not Morgan Frost, Matthew Strunk just figured that out this year, that the best thing to make him be more successful would just be boxing guys out all the time and using his body to that advantage that way because he's never going to be the biggest skater. And so... That I, I feel like Geeky is obviously significantly better than him, but like if you're not the best skater and you're that strong on the puck, I don't think you just have to be like a B plus and you'll be fine. I, I think Geeky, um, I'm a little worried like the shoulders aren't as wide as I think they could be as far as um, putting on significant uh, muscle, which I think he'll need, but he's got all you know a lot of other things. He's got great hand, eye hands, he's got a terrific shot, he's good both ways. 
I do feel like the skating will get a little better, but again, remember Matt Strom worked with Barbara in the Hill too. It doesn't work mm-hmm. for everybody, but I still think geeky could play at the NHL level at his skating level. So, um, you know, he'll be in the conversation cause he's a six, four center. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And the guy that's not going to be in the conversation at five, but uh, whoever gets them where they have Buffalo getting them that I just love, loved watching in the world juniors was really the only good guy on his team. Minus mm-hmm. a couple other guys just from his country was Casper. I yeah. kind of took my eye when I was watching the tournament and I started talking about him then. And then all of a sudden he's in the middle of the draft board where I feel like he might end up being one of those guys that like years down the line, you're saying he's one of the better centers out of the draft where coming in, he's just kind of from a country. Everybody's not really talking about obviously having top 16, top 15, whatever he ends up getting potentially picked at products from and all of a sudden then like say five years down the line this guy's out of the draft like the third best center or something because he's such a good well-rounded guy that's a, is good at skiing he and is he is, he is good and well-rounded i don't know how high his ceiling is uh i think there's a little bit of recency bias i've got him at like 21 right now uh as far as a ranking but uh i think people went a little crazy with him that doesn't mean teams won't they might uh but you know, I'm not quite there with uh, fully with Casper there, but I, I do yeah. like a lot of the things he does. Well, I didn't have him that much different than you. I have my ranking on the sheet of paper. I had him at 18. Okay. okay. So 18 to 21 is not a huge. No. That's only a few point difference there. Um, but I, I just told you, like, at 18, though, I really like, like, if I had that pick and I was able to pick Casper, like I would, it was more like if I was the GM in that situation, I would really like that pick because I think he's definitely going to pan out as an eight. And the pick's not going to hurt you. It, it, yeah. I would, I would say it might depend on who's possibly fallen to to look at too. Yeah, because I think he's a safe pick. I feel like he's going to yes. be a guy that's going to be at least a B player that just plays mm-hmm. great defense for you and becomes maybe that like Erickson Eck guy that produces mm-hmm. 40 to 45 points and then could become more than that when people expect Erickson Eck to kind of become in the next year or so. Yeah, uh, like maybe that. so like that type of guy. Totally possible. But uh, wrapping up, uh, that gave us the draft. When it comes to the Flyers, a big thing that's going around right now is the certain somebody from right across the bridge that is that grew up as a uh, fan of the Philadelphia Flyers. That there's been a lot of rumors going around that Johnny Gaudreau wants to play in Philadelphia. One, how true are those rumors? And two, do you think Johnny Gaudreau is going to be in Philadelphia next year? I think there's always been truth to it, and you know his family's close by, uh, fairly close to where I live. And but I think the issue with Johnny Gaudreau is if you're going to pay him ten million bucks, then you're going to have to have someone eat all of JVR's contract, which could cost more than you want, which I wouldn't want to give up any kind of high pick for that. Not again. So that's an issue. And even if it's a couple of the 2023 picks, I don't want to do it because the Flyers, you know, system is starting to get whittled away a little bit. And then the other issue is um, you still have to be able to sign Sanheim. You still have to figure out with Frost by the 25th. You still got to figure out, Allison and you know all these still gonna have to get more guys on defense at least one more defenseman uh because you have cam york uh i wouldn't do it i think it's i think it's the closest step to being tapped out that they could you know be at and i just think you're going to put all these resources into it and then if it doesn't work you'll be rebuilding anyhow yeah i feel like the one way i was trying to think of ways they could trade jvr without having to give up a astronomic amount of picks and I feel like they could include certain guys. Like TK's been in trade rumors, so if you throw TK in the trade, sure. But now someone's got to be able to swallow, like you know, twelve yeah. and a half million. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. Which would only be really Arizona. So then Arizona right. would want to have to have Konechny and uh, James Van Riemsdyk. So if that's the case, then that might work out. But uh, I think. That I wouldn't be opposed to that because Goudreau's a much better, smaller skating guy that's significantly better than any of them. So, like, that's why I would, but like, I kind of see it from both sides where, like, I understand the standpoint of we're going to be cap strong if we do it, but that stadium was so depressing this year 
that I wouldn't mind having a guy when I was talking to Peter Lowe about it earlier, that's just box office, that no matter how depressing the team is as a whole, people are probably just going to show up more because Johnny's on the team. Where, like, it's not going to make everything better by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. But it's at least going to make you not go to the stadium and want to leave 17 minutes in because of how depressing the setting is with 500 people there. So, like, like yeah. there's a there's more like the balancing cord in my mind from like the knowing as like an analysis perspective of it. Like I don't want to screw the team over and someone that thinks in like the managerial numbers style stuff. But then there's the other side of, I don't want to have an empty stadium the entire season. That's really depressing to go to like last year. So like other than Jerusalem, you know, sometimes you got to put up with that though. And I, I think putting up with that for a couple of years, would have been the answer, but they're going to go the other way, so they'll probably make you happy. Yeah. Well, I don't even know. Like, that's the thing. I don't even know how happy it would end up making me in the end. I feel like it would just be one of those things that's like, oh, yeah, there's people here. But, like, they're going right. to have to have uh, things fall into place. Like, Atkinson's going to have to continue yeah. to do really well as a veteran. You're going to have to continue to have guys develop. Frost is going to have to take a bigger step, probably. Like, I was kind of saying to you, um, on Twitter, I feel like would be best as a winger just because I feel like Noah would be best as a center and you can just flip yeah. two. And Noah doesn't want to time. play center, so that's a whole other conversation for another day. Yeah, 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 I heard about that, but I feel like if you can convince him, it might be best. But either way, I'm fine with him playing wing because you played the wing perfectly fine, but yeah. it's just then I feel like you might just be best putting both on each each other's sides and then just finding where like, you, know, you want to put Scotty or whoever you want to put down the center, Tanner, if he makes the team down the center with them and end up having your own kids line. Like, you should just do it like that because I feel like both of them play best suited for the – well, no, I think the play center is one to play center, but I think Frost definitely plays best suited for the way. Yeah, I think most likely that's true, but he did – he was around 49%, 49.5% on faceoff. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not convinced. That is a good that, that is a good point. Yeah, I guess it's more play style when you watch him yeah. where his face offs have gone up, but play style, it looks like he would have more room and ability to do stuff from the wing supposed to center. But face off wise, he has become maybe one of those guys you could mix in at center because he is in the fifty percent almost tile and will probably be there by next year. So I think that's what the Flyers also tend to like having as a team now. We'll see what the new coach likes, but it seems like over the course of the last few years, they always like having guys you can slide at center or put on the wing. So it seems like even in the last couple of years, they kind of drafted guys from that elk of possibility as well. So uh, that's not necessarily surprising uh, to me either. Like if you draft a boy, a boy fits into that, even though like I agree with you, I feel like he's going to be a center, but he's still kind of, in probably most people's minds fits into that. Well, he's going to, he can be a great winger or he's going to also be a great center. So like that. So I feel like um, that's kind of the same boat there. That's why I feel like the Flyers have a good chance of picking them because if they're still picking from that mindset, that kind of perfectly fits into the guy. But it depends kind of what mindset they're picking from at that point. But I think that's about, uh, as Pirlo likes to say, it's about 28 minutes, but that's our full 42, as uh, my good friend Steve likes to say. Uh, Russ, I, I want to thank you for joining. It's been a privilege to have you on. Uh, anytime, you Joe. Share anything. You wanted to share anything you wanted to share out, like the Locked On Flyers, definitely check that out. He does yeah, Locked On Flyers. Um, you know, I write for Elite Prospects, my own website, sportsology.com. You can go to Amazon. Dot com. Check out any of my books. DM me if you want any of, of them signed uh, for Father's Day. That's always a good gift. Uh, yeah, all those things. Uh, full press coverage. Just put out um, an article about the Combine. And I do have one on, on Sportsology about the Combine, too. So check those out. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely recommend checking those out. Uh, reading about prospects is definitely one of my more fun things to do and watching the scouting film and stuff. And I know... A lot. I know a lot of other hockey nerds that really like doing that, that listen to the podcast usually, so I would definitely recommend checking those out. But anyway, everybody, please continue to subscribe down below. Have a great, safe day. We're going to have another great game of hockey on tonight that either the Rangers are going to go up 3-1 to one, or the Tampa Bay Lightning are going to be able to even up the series 2-2. Two to two. So we'll see where the tides of that series go starting this evening. Stay safe out there, everybody. 
and enjoy the hockey.